start uh, okay so hello everyone uh, good afternoon uh, so today's session is on automatic text summarization by dr path mehta from panmonic ai so yeah over to pat um hi everyone um, it's nice to see uh, a lot of interested participants young participants uh, who are uh, beginning their journey in nlp and i hope you guys enjoyed um, the last uh, week or so of uh, the school and i hope uh, it sparks interest in at least some of you to pursue this field uh, further to give some introduction about myself um i did my phd with uh, prashanjit majumdar the person who is behind this winter school i i graduated from dict in 2018 and since then i've been working with parmonic um, it's a us based startup and I, we are specifically working on uh, summarizing webinars and talks or summarizing video content uh summarization also happens to be my phd dissertation topic so um when i was approached about this school this was the natural topic that i wanted to talk about and uh, in today like in couple of hours i'll uh, take you through uh, some very basic techniques of how we do text summarization and it's it's less about um, any specific technique and more about thinking like how to model a summarization problem how to use the mathematical tools that you already know to for a specific purpose in this case summarization so i hope you enjoy this and uh, i since this is remote it cannot be very interactive but i would still appreciate if you guys are uh, you keep asking questions or let me know if uh, something is not clear and i hope we can have at least some interaction uh, over the course of next couple of hours um all right uh, shuru uh, should we wait for uh, more people or uh, this is okay we can go ahead i think we can start now okay so i'll just turn off my video uh, i'm on a low bandwidth connection and uh, you guys can sh- see my screen if there is any issue with the screen sharing just let me know uh, like interrupt in between all right okay so uh, automatic text summarization uh, what does this what does come what comes to your mind when you think about this like when you hear about something called automatic text summarization what comes to your mind anyone a quick quick uh, answer nothing in detail just something that what what sparks in your mind when you look at this topic generating a summary of a document sir like you use a tool in order to immediately generate a summary okay and uh, what kind of summary so you are right uh, that is true and the uh, important part here is automatic so we don't want any human intervention saying that okay this part of the document is important or this is not so important we want it to be completely automated that is one uh, criteria um uh, so this is the outline of uh, what we are planning today uh, i'll give you a brief overview of what automatic text summarization is about then we'll talk about two specific types of summarization extractive and abstractive techniques we'll look somewhat into detail into how we do evaluation of automatic automatically generated summaries uh so this is this is a part where uh, i'll diverge from the traditional um, evaluation techniques and i'll tell you a bit about how things work in the industry like what does industry look at uh, and not just purely from an academic perspective and then in the end after a couple of hours we'll have a hands on session where you'll play around with a jupiter notebook and uh, hopefully by the end of it you should be able to generate at least a very basic summary of any document that you like all right so without wasting much time uh, wikipedia de- defines automatic text summarization in this way it is a process of shortening a set of data computationally to create a subset that represents the most important information within the original content very blunt definition but it's usually what it is so say you are uh, 
going through like you have exams in a couple of hours and you just started reading about a topic what you would usually do is you would ask your friends that okay can you please highlight what is important in this and what what i should read for the exams that is one kind of summary so there can be several kinds of summaries this is one kind where you just look at some parts of the document which you think or which your friend thinks is important and um, we can call that a summary but there are many other types of summary and we'll come to that but first why summarize again like any any takers like why do you want to summarize something what's the point can't you go through the whole document are you being too lazy what's what's the point here why do we want to summarize to save the time in understanding the document the gist of the document that is correct so uh, that is one natural thing that uh, everyone wants like why should i spend uh, two two hours reading this whole uh, big document when i can get a good summary that is one part here are the other aspects like why summarization is important especially today so uh, with internet suddenly the amount of information that we can access has exploded previously if you wanted to read about a topic you would go to a library you would get a couple of books and you would look into it now there is information everywhere and it's impossible for a person to consume all that information without some sort of filtering so summarization is one way how we can filter out uh, non relevant information it's not the only way it's one of the ways second as uh, shrini ji said like it saves time naturally like we are all busy people so why not do something in 15 minutes rather than taking 2 hours for it what else this is another important point our attention spans are continuously decreasing so previously uh, you would look at students and they say like, they go through entire books to find something important now there is so much distraction around us that we cannot stay on a topic for more than a set amount of time you you will find maybe some whatsapp buzzing or there is some new comment on your facebook post and you will drift off so uh, decreasing attention span means you, you have to consume information in as little time as possible because otherwise you will not consume it at all you will just move on to something else and this is important not just from personal perspective but even for industry for example you are looking at reviews on amazon for maybe a room heater it's very cold these days and uh, if if it's very easy to i i understand okay how good or bad it is you will purchase it purchase it immediately but say you have to scroll down three pages to just find out how good or how bad that particular product is you will likely move on maybe to other website or you will not buy it at all even so it's important for lot of um, e-commerce providers or even other like content providers that they summarize their content as much as possible to keep you hooked on so to keep you from moving on to something else so that's another thing it might be good it might be bad it's debatable but that's one of the reasons and finally the modality of interaction with information is changing rapidly if you look just 5 years back the biggest way you were consuming information was through text right maybe reading newspapers reading articles something now uh, eventually or like gradually the voice enabled devices are getting very common so uh, it's not unheard of um, as of today that you would rather ask something to google saying okay google or hey siri or hi alexa and you ask your question and you uh, expect the answer in form of a spoken uh, content uh, this dramatically changes because you don't want to listen to siri or alexa speaking an entire paragraph what you want is a very crisp answer in two or three sentences likewise for google like whether you Uh, use voice search or whether you use text you expect answers these days you don't even want to click on links and then navigate to the pages and then look for the answer yourself 
you want it to be there right in front of you without doing anything so with this uh, change in the way we interact with information the more we go towards uh, speech based devices the more um, text summarization gets important it becomes important there might be a question that if we go to text speech based devices there is no text so why text summarization like how is it important well most of the speech devices actually all of them at this point they work on text they they kind of uh, generate speech from text but in in the back end the whole processing still happens on text data so text summarization can equally be used in a voice enabled device and this is why you want to summarize and these are some reasons there are more of course and then the next question is how are we going to use these summaries like where are we going to use these summaries okay so the first thing is the usual um, place news articles all of us have heard about in shorts or google news where you get these snippets or headlines so even before text summarization was um, was fashionable news papers did give headlines to news articles some two three bullet point summary and this is a natural way to consume news articles so yes this is a snap from in shorts okay just ignore the image on the top behind is a screenshot from in shorts which gives you a three line summary of a news article you don't even have to read it or open the article the summary is just there the other way is you are reading about a particular topic on in newspaper or on websites and there can be more than one articles related to that topic so you want to collate information from everywhere and just get one final summary which is also called as multi document summarization we'll come to that the next way is research papers uh, so any master students here masters or phd perhaps or any uh, bachelor student yes. who uh, who are like who read uh, new research papers already at least some of you do right yes yes sir so uh, when you read a research paper the first thing you look at is abstract right like okay what this paper is about what did it achieve and only if it is important then you go on to read the whole content so abstract is one kind of summary that we use in our at least the researchers use in their day to day lives search results as i mentioned when you want when you search something you want the answer to be there you don't want to click the links anymore so that's where summarization can be handy legal documents uh, any anyone who has some experience uh, working with lawyers or at least know how law works um okay let let me go on so uh, in countries like india past judgments by supreme court or any any court for that matter high court or district court they become law of the land so if uh, so if supreme court said that okay in this particular case this guy was okay in stealing so and so thing from so and so person because these were the circumstances if once the court pronounces that the next time it cannot say differently that becomes a law so next time somebody steals something under same circumstances he can cite a previous uh, judgment and say hey supreme court look you said this was okay then so it should be okay for me as well it's called a precedent and which is why uh, navigating through legal judgments becomes very important for a lawyer when he is arguing a case and there are uh, technical summaries of these judgments called as head notes which are uh, which uh, basically include gist of the whole judgment like what the judge is felt what were the arguments that were made what were the facts of the case and finally what was the verdict so uh, this can be another place where summarization is useful likewise for medical records or uh, for user reviews like we said you look something on amazon you want a summary of how good the reviews were uh, this summary might not necessarily be in text it can be graphical like in this case 
or it can also be like a paragraph of text generated from thousand different reviews which just says that um, the heating is good but it gets hot very like the body gets hot or the cord is very uh, short something like that you can generate summaries from by collating uh, thousand different reviews and show it in two sentences and finally uh, this talk can be summarized you might be thinking like it's a pre lunch session i don't want to listen to him babble for too long hours why can't i just get a 15 minute summary of this video so uh, fortunately that is what we are doing at parmonic you put in a recorded uh, slide show based uh, video or recorded webinar or a record recorded panel discussion and Uh, we use uh, summarization to identify the key moments or key parts of the video to which you should pay attention so these are some ways in which we can use uh, summarization okay so uh, is there just one type of summarization certainly not right as we already saw there can be single document or multi document summarizer so you want to summarize just one particular chapter of a book or all the chapters of a book or multiple news articles related to a single topic anything so uh, this categorization can be on several several uh, different aspects one of them is input type where it can be single document or multi document we already discussed that the other is output type how does your summary look like so uh, i can say that uh, one way of summarizing research papers is writing abstracts that is something that you do while you are writing the paper so that is an abstractive summary but when a reader is reading the same research paper and he finds something interesting he or she usually highlights certain parts of the paper so it picks up whole sentences doesn't rewrite uh, in their own words it just highlights okay this is important which is called a sentence extraction or extractive techniques so it depends on what kind of summary you want and also depends on what kind of technology is available because abstractive summary is usually not very easy to generate we will come to that later in this talk the other type of summarization like other aspect on which you can categorize it is context type um do you just want a generic summary okay this article sounds interesting why don't you give me the most significant points from this um, article that is generic i don't have any information need i don't have any knowledge about the article nothing i just want a summary the other one is domain specific summary this this is where things get interesting so uh, for example when you look at a legal judgment there can be a line saying the judge used section uh, 370 of the indian constitution and section 370 means blah 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 the judge used it in a particular context now if a lawyer is reading it he most likely knows what section 370 is about he doesn't want its definition he doesn't want the sentence which says section 370 mentions blah 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 what he is really interested is how in what context uh, this was used right so uh, that's where domain knowledge prior domain knowledge comes into picture or uh, let me give you a different example uh, when you look at a legal document or a medical record they are very technical highly technical uh, documents right they have these certain terms which are not really present in a general document so sometimes what can happen is your text summarization system can uh, feel that okay these are very different terms from what i usually encounter so this should go into a summary but for a legal or a medical document those technical terms are pretty common there is nothing special about it so if you know what domain you are summarizing you can use a lot of extra information to generate better summaries that is domain specific summarization 
And then there can be very specific summarization. Okay, this is a huge Wikipedia article about Game of Thrones. I don't want the whole summary. I just want summary of uh, maybe the Battle of uh, Winterfell, right? So you put in that query, and your summary is tailored to that particular information need. It's not. It doesn't try to cover everything in the document. It just tries to answer your particular query. So that is query specific summarization. And these are only some ways in which we can. Uh, categorize there are other ways like modality whether you want to generate uh, charts or graphs as output instead of summary so say you have a numerical data and your summary will be visual summary like pie charts or graphs or tables and not really text that is that is a different kind of categorization and there can be many such things but uh, this is the general categorization that uh, is used most commonly Okay, so then let's go on to uh, sentence extraction. Or okay, before that, uh, let me let me uh, just uh, stress upon a few basics. Like whatever kind of uh, text summarization you look at, whether it's extractive, abstractive, whether it's uh, query specific or multi-document, anything, there are certain things which you will certain tools which you will always require. And uh, text summarization research is as much ab about um, finding new such tools as about actual summarization. So what are these tools or building blocks? One is how the way in which you represent text. There can be n different ways. And each way has its own merits, demerits, and advantages, trends. You can use one hot encoding. So uh, let me pause here for a second and ask whether uh, any kind of text representation was uh, covered in previous sessions or whether you are aware like of different ways of, in which text can be represented. Yes, sir. So what all was covered? Like any, any example? Yes, okay, perfect. So you, you guys know already that. So that's that's nice. So a one hot encoding is something uh, even uh, more basic than TF-IDF. Uh, basically, say you have, you know, thousand words in your vocabulary, then each of your word can be represented as a one cross thousand dimension vector where only one of those dimension is non-zero, uh, which, which corresponds to that particular word and the others are zero. And when you look at sentences, you just add up and the words in the sentences will have non-zero values. The others will all have zero values and your vectors will have size equal to that of your vocabulary. That's, that's the more simplified version of TF-IDF. TF-IDF, you don't have just binary, but uh, the non-zero values are actually uh, ranked or weighted depending on how important that term is. But the dimensions still remain the same, like one cross the size of vocabulary. And then there are word embeddings which can have a fixed length uh, representation. I will not go into detail since it's already covered, so uh, you guys will already be knowing about that. But uh, this choice is very important when you design a new summarization system. Likewise, you'll always rely on similarity function. Let me give you an example. Just think of human summarizing a text piece of text. What uh, he or she will look at is how close my summary is to my original document, right? Now that notion of closeness or notion of similarity can be defined in 100 different ways. And depending on how you define it, you can get a very different kind of summary. Some basic functions that we use are word overlap. So if there are two sentences, the ratio of uh, how many words there are in common to the actual number of words in the sentences is called as word overlap. Or cosine similarity, like you have two vectors, find cosine similarity of those two, and that is a similarity. 
there are other more uh, complex uh, methods like KL divergence, for example. You treat each piece of text as a, as a probability distribution. So you probably this was probably covered in language modeling part. So you for each piece of text you can have probability of a particular word. Say the word is for example summarization. In document one probability of summarization occurring is point two, and in document three the probability is point one. So this different in probability or different in distribution. Like when you look at probabilities of all the words, you get a probability distribution. So difference in how these words are distributed across two documents can be captured by uh, KL divergence, uh, which is nothing but cross entropy between two probability distributions, and then. there can be different ways in which you can rank content so okay you you define the way in which you want to rank or in which you want to represent each sentence then you define what do you call as similar sentences and then what do you do with this information is what depends on how you do content ranking so how you use one and two to rank your sentences or rank your phrases or rank your paragraphs anything that uh, uh, falls under content ranking there are different ways to do that and we'll see some of that okay word frequency based summarization uh, so we'll start with some extractive techniques and the most basic way in which you can summarize is based on word frequency um anyone wants to take a guess like how this should work this is very simple uh, anyone like wants to guess like how how uh, we'll go about doing this computing length of sentences maybe sorry computing length of sentences maybe length of sentences um okay but what will we do with length so uh, okay let let's let's take a step back uh, right now in this particular most basic technique uh, we are going ground up so first we are looking for important words and then based on how many important words a sentence has we score that particular sentence so if you were given say an article about nuclear physics you have no idea what nuclear what that article is about but just looking at the article can you find out the important words like what might be important is it possible as a human not not for nlp just as a human yes yes sir how would you do that so now like we will search for the uh, words which are uh, free, more frequent than other words in the document and we will assume that these words are of more importance correct so if for example if a article is about uh, cricket then naturally there will be a lot of mention about bowling batting or fielding or umpiring and you see that okay bat the word bat seems to occur so much more in this particular document when you compare it against other documents so i am guessing that okay bat might be important for this particular document this is the which we can assign scores to words so basically more the more frequent a word is more important it is assumed to be it's not always true but that's what assume for this basic technique and then how do you send score a sentence based on it word is based very simple just add up scores of individual words in that sentence and that gives you scores of the whole sentence and now you select the top k most important words or sentences as a summary right so uh, in summarization we usually uh, don't prefer selecting sentences because sentences can vary in length so much there can be a huge sentence with 30 words there can be three small sentences of seven words each 
and uh, when you compare summary in, in terms of number of sentences it can be very misle misleading so we usually select top keywords but sentences is also accept acceptable in some cases where you know that the sentence lengths are not uh, varying too much but this is the most basic way in which we can summarize a document then uh, there are other more uh, sophisticated ways so the most common or most uh, used or most popular i would say method is a centroid based method centroid based centroid based method is not exactly a single method it's it's kind of a family of methods where the whole idea is say you have a document with 100 sentences you represent these sentences in form of vector space it can be tf idf vector or it can be word embeddings or anything and then you find a centroid of these sentences centroid is a point which is close to most other points in the whole vector space so you do that and you get a centroid a abstract vector which is not same as any sentence it's something new uh, but it it represents the core essence of the document right and then what you do is you identify say you want to select top 5 sentences you identify the sentences that are closest to the centroid which means that those sentences have most information in common with the whole document right and we call that a summary so let's see let's see how it would look like say we have sentences this is a document a 2d representation of some vector space each uh, circle is a sentence ignore the color coding for now all the sentences are equivalent what we do is we find a new point in this vector space which which is a centroid the the dark purple point uh, and there are mathematical ways to do, do that we'll come to that but we find this abstract centroid and then we compare each sentence to this particular centroid and then we select the five that are closest to the centroid in this case they are marked by the sentences connected with an arrow so the light ones on the periphery are sentences which are not included in the summary the five in uh, between are the summaries that sentences that are in the summary and the darkest one is the centroid it's an abstract point it's not an actual sentence it's an abstract point that we computed based on all other points and then we get these five sentences as the summary right so let's say uh, one way to define centroid is a pseudo document which consists of all the important words important in this context is defined as a tf idf score above a threshold but it could be very well anything else so uh, say you have 1000 terms in your document 1000 words in your document 1000 unique words you find out tf idf score for each of those words select 300 which are above a threshold those 300 words combined irrespective of the order it's a bag of words approach so without any ordering these 300 words combined form a centroid and now all you have to do is compare other sentences with the centroid vector using cosine or anything else and see which are the most similar ones say let's see an example sentence 1 has uh five words you you know seven words there are seven words in your vocabulary sentence 1 has five of them three out of these five have a tf idf score above your required threshold the ones in different shades of red the ones in different shades of green are words which are there in your sentence but which you don't think are important okay likewise sentence 2 so there are four words three of which are important for you one is not so can anyone tell me what would a centroid for these two sentences would look like 
if I were to compute the centroid just based on these two, what would it look like? The definition is right there. And uh, hint is, it will still be a one cross seven vector. You just need to tell me which entries will be non-zero. Anyone? So first and second will surely be non-zero. Okay, what else? Um, and then the third, fifth one uh, might be the green again. It, Maybe the fifth one also can have. First, second, and fifth one, uh, so let's take a look at the uh, definition once again. Pseudo document is a document which contains words that have TF IDF scores above a threshold. It, the, you, what you seem to be doing is looking for similarity in sentence one and two. Don't do that. Just look for important words. What are the important words if you consider these two sentences? Word having maximum PFIDF score. Yes, and that is defined like the way I defined it was the ones which are in shades of red. So, uh, so whites are basically zero. They don't occur in that sentence at all. Greens are the one which occur, but they have a TFIDF score less than the threshold that we want. And the ones in shades of red are the ones which are important. So your centroid will look like this. Basically, all the words which uh, which are which have uh, TFIDF above a threshold. Clear? Is it clear? Yes. Okay. So now, uh, can someone tell me how uh, we know the centroid? We know sentence one. We know sentence two. How would you compute compare similarity between sentence one and centroid? What would it be? Cosine similarity. Just let's let's just assume cosine similarity. So basically, you what what does your sentence one have in common with the centroid? There are three words, right? The first one, second one, and the fourth one. So that is your similarity. The other in other dimensions, the overlap is zero. Right. <coughs> So now take a step back, think about the frequency based math method that we talked about. If you replace this TFIDF score with just the frequency, it becomes the word frequency based summarizer. So what essentially we showed is the frequency based summarization was just a special case of the centroid based method. There can be a different special case where you define uh, the sentence vectors differently. So that will in turn mean that your centroid is defined differently. And then you can use a different similarity score, but the overall idea is still that you are comparing your uh, sentences with an abstract centroid. So that's why I say centroid based summarization is actually a family of systems, not just a single system. Okay, so, so far so good, but uh, can we do better? Of course we can, this, this is just a very simple way. Uh, so the next uh, extractive technique that I want to talk about is centrality based summarization. Sentences that are similar to several other sentences in a cluster are more central. So you see the essential difference. Previously, we had this abstract centroid and anything that is uh, close to a centroid is important. Now we are saying that, okay, we can define this notion of important sentence differently. Any sentence which has a lot in common with a lot of other sentence is more important. So instead of just comparing each sentence to the centroid, we do a pairwise comparison. So if you have five sentences, you will have a five cross five matrix. Of course, like it will be a diagonal, like lower diagonal matrix. So it can be sparse, but 
uh, in short, you'll have uh, pairwise similarities for each pair of those five sentences. And then the one which is connected to most other sentences is important, right? Again, like how do you define similarity? It could be anything. For example, next rank, which we'll talk about in detail, uses for sign. Text rank, which is similar to Lix rank, but uses a different similarity score, word overlap, or anything else. How do we define centrality? There are, again, different ways. We'll talk about degree centrality and eigen centrality, but they are not just two ways, like there are more. Um, but the core difference here is you compare sentences with other sentences. There is no centroid anymore. So uh, let's start with degree centrality. Say uh, you have an election in college, okay? There are two candidates who are uh, maybe want to uh, stand for president of the student union or something. One of those candidates has 20 friends. The other candidate has maybe five friends. Who do you think will win the election? The one with the more friends. Right, that's, that's the usual assumption. So the one who has more connections, who has more friends, wins the election. Likewise, in any like, other aspects of life, the more you are connected, the more leverage you have. So the idea behind degree centrality is something similar. If a sentence is connected to a lot of other sentences, it is assumed to be important. So we represent each document or a set of documents in form of a graph where each sentence is a node and each edge is similarity between two particular sentences. And then degree centrality is defined as the number of similar sentences for each sentence. Say uh, you want score for sentence SI, where I is some number. You compare it with all other sentences in the document. If the similarity threshold is above a particular threshold, then you say, okay, this these two nodes are connected. There is an edge between them. Otherwise, there is no edge between them. And the sum of those edges is the importance of that particular node or that particular sentence. So this is how a document might look like. So this is an example from a paper by Arkan et al, a paper that proposed the graph-based method for text summarization. Let's talk about the graph first. What the nodes mean is D1, S1 means the first sentence in the first document. So this is a multi-document summarization example where D1, D2, up till D5 are five documents, and S1, S2, they are sentences within that document. So D1, S1 is first sentence in first document. Likewise, D3, S2 is second sentence in third document. And the edges between them are uh, of different weights, depending on how similar those sentences are. So if this, if the similarity is above 0 0.3, then they have the thickest edge. There are only two such cases between D1, S1 and D2, S1. And the other one is on the left side between D5, S3 and D5, S1. So there are only two cases where your edge weight are above 0 0.3. And likewise for other cases. So how, do, how would you define degree of these nodes? just compute the edges. So for example, if we choose 0 0.2 as threshold or say 0 0.3 as threshold, for example, to make things simpler. So we only consider the edges which are, which have more than 0 0.3 similarity. So uh, D1S1 will have two such edges, one with D1S1, uh, one between D1S1 and D2S1. The other one is with itself. So remember, uh, we are taking all, pay, all pairwise similarities. So these edges to the nodes themselves are not shown, but they exist. 
So D1S1 has the most in common with itself. Next, it has the most in common with D2S1. And now if we use 0.3 as threshold, it will have just these two connections. So that's why if you look at the last column in the table, degree 0.3, you'll see that D1S1 has just two connections, like we showed. Likewise, D2S1 one has two connections, one with itself and one with D1S1. Again, there is one more thick edge between D5S1 and D5S3. So those two will have degree two. All other nodes are not connected to any other node if we assume a high threshold. It's just connected to themselves. So all of them have degree one. Is it clear or do you want me to go through this once again? This is, this is important for a lot of next content. It's clear, sir. So if we go by uh, ranking by degree and choose a threshold of 0 0.3, then these four sentences will be the highest rank. The others will be lower rank. And if you want to form a summary, we'll choose these four sentences, right? Clear enough? And if we decrease the threshold, of course, things change. So if we decrease the threshold to 0 0.2, then uh, D1, S1 is uh, connected to more nodes, likewise for other, uh, other sentences, right? So, uh, so for example, point two D one S one has four edges, three edges, and one edge to itself. So the three edges are between D one S one and D four S one, D one S one and D three S two, and D one S one and D two S one plus one edge to itself. So that's why it has degree four, and likewise for other nodes. So this is this is a simple way in which you can uh, rank nodes, rank sentences, and then select the best ones. But is this good enough? So going back to our um, election uh, example, say there are 100 students in a class. You are standing for the election as president of student union. You have just eight friends. Your opponent has 20 friends. And there are total 100 students in the class. But now I will give you some new information. The eight friends that you have are really good. So they are either captains of sports team or chairperson of debate club or academically they are toppers. So they in turn have a lot more connections and a lot more convincing power. So even though your opponent has just 20 friends, he has 20 friends and you have just eight, but your friends are more important. And that's why they can convince other students to vote for you. And you might as well end up winning the election. So basically, uh, what I mean to say is, it, it doesn't only depend on how many people you know, or how many nodes you are connected to, but it also depends on how good or how bad those nodes are. And this is where eigen centrality comes into picture. Okay, so uh, let's take a short break of five minutes. Uh, I'll be there if you have any questions. And then we resume with uh, this topic, eigen centrality, like how, what better we can do compared to the previous technique. Okay. Okay. Sir. So uh, meanwhile, if anyone has any doubt so far or something is not clear, just feel free to shoot a question. Is it too uh, easy until now or too difficult? These are the only two cases where people are usually silent. So, uh, it's a bit different, but it was uh, easier to understand, sir. At least you explained it well. Okay, so uh, at any point, if you, if you think like this content is going too slow, then I can speed things up a bit and we can go to more complex stuff. Just let me know. Sure, sir.
so while we are on a break uh, okay not not that that's a bad uh, example you'll know later why but anyway while we take a break um i am just curious like what kind of mix of students do we have here uh, how many like, maybe you can just raise hands or uh, type in like how many of you are btech students okay just one that's interesting okay more people coming in okay and what about master students how many of you are master students okay rest time assuming i either are uh, asleep after a good lunch or are doing their phd's or i don't know all right so we have a good mix and uh, anyone who has actually worked with nlp problems before or all of you are new to this okay. all right so i i hope uh, you guys are enjoying it not not just this but the whole school so anyone here has previous experience working with uh, neural networks uh, maybe in text or maybe elsewhere in general so what area meena uh, nlp sir in nlp oh great what did you work so, on using deep learning techniques uh, sorry i i couldn't catch that what using uh, deep learning i'm using deep learning techniques like uh, neural network those things and yes, my topic is like fake news detection i'm doing my mtech oh that's great that's great anyone else cnn techniques for computer vision okay that's great all right so i i think we can um, move on with our presentation there is a lot to cover so again like uh, i'll ask the same question again so far anything that's confusing between because that builds the base for rest of this talk so i'll be happy to clarify if anything was confusing or was not clear all right so let's let's move on then so uh, previously we discussed uh, degree centrality based technique where basically the number of sentences to which a particular sentence is, is connected it determines the score of that particular sentence so 
but we don't take into account how good the target sentences are in eigen centrality or uh, popularly known as lex rank or tex rank we do things differently so we also consider how good the those subsequent nodes were let's see an example say you have one sentence connected to four other sentences it's just like the election example that i uh, explained and okay so just ignore the five nodes here let's let's assume there are only four nodes four light green nodes instead of five so in that case uh, degree centrality will give the same score to both dark red and dark green sentences but these light green sentences are connected further to other sentences which essentially means that the dark green node shares a lot more information with other sentences compared to the dark red node and it should be ranked higher all right and how do we do this like so how do we uh, compute these uh, this iteratively so does anyone see a problem say let's see let's say we start with the green dark green node and we add up the scores of the five nodes connected directly to it but we don't know the scores of those five nodes so we rely in turn on the light green seven light green nodes to determine the importance or the scores of the five nodes in between and which in turn is used to determine the score of the dark green node right so it's an iterative process but does anyone see a problem with this kind of process it's it, is it just simple addition like can we just add up like this or will there be a problem problem might be there it thinks so. so what's the problem you can type in so uh, i i see one problem here say um, how do you determine the node the weight of those outer nodes so what what is prior knowledge like what what did you mean by that monali means we don't know whether uh, how many next connections are there at the time when we are uh, at calculating the no but if it if is you, not if, uh, supervised then okay but if you have a whole document say 100 nodes then you can build the whole graph a priori so you don't really need much prior knowledge in that case it's just based on connections uh, okay srinidhi so, what do you mean by overlapping nodes care to explain uh so what i thought was we can have like uh, the uh two nodes connecting to one single node in the other deeper layer so it like, will be counted twice right so yes that's exactly correct so say say uh, for example uh, I, i don't know if you can see my mouse can you can you see my cursor you can see right yes say sir suppose edge between this and this yes, node sir. here right so that will be a problem okay that is one problem what else so i see another problem is we are just assuming that we know the scores for these peripheral nodes but for computing the scores of those peripheral nodes we in turn depend on these internal nodes so it's it's kind of a chicken and egg problem right because the importance of this dark green node will in turn yes sir affect the importance of the light green nodes and vice versa it will it will go on so we need some kind of iterative process to do that and which is where markov chains come into uh, our come to our help so a markov chain is basically a process where if you know the outcome at any given point in time the future outcome depends on just that so for example if you have a step wise process with step 0 step 1 step 2 and step 3 the output of step 3 will depend only on the output at step 2 it will not really consider anything like it doesn't matter how you reached until step 2 there can be multiple ways 
but as long as you reach step 2 the rest of the thing remains same while computing step 3 so it doesn't matter whether you came from 0 to 1 or 0 to 1 to 100 to back to 2 it doesn't matter so that's what a markov chain is and uh, we so for example let's see this network right we have three sentences a b and c each sentence is obviously connected to itself it is similar and then there are sentences between a and like edge between a and b and edge between a and c oh, sorry b and c right so we can have a adjacency matrix with uh, which is nothing but whether or not edges are present between those nodes and now we can compute probability so for example probability of reaching node a from node b is always 1 by 3 it doesn't matter how you reached b in the first place say you could have gone from c to b and then to a or you could have been at b went again back to b and then to a doesn't matter as long as you, you are at node b the probability that you will travel to node a is 1 by 3 because from b you can take three routes to a to c or to b itself right Likewise, if you are at node A, there is no way to go directly to node C. There is no connection. So that probability is zero. There are just two ways to go. You can go back to node A or you can go to node B. And that's why probability, those probabilities are one by two each. Uh, just hold on to this thought for a minute. This has nothing to do with summarization. This is just something which we, a tool which we will use for our benefit. But yeah, this is what a Markov chain looks like. So uh, let's say you are at node C, you are at node A, and you want to reach node C in two steps. That's why P2. Like now we just don't have one step, we have two steps. So you'll have to go to B and then to C, right? So probability of reaching from A to C in two steps is in turn that in the first step, you travel from A to B. So probability of B given A in step one, in step two, probability of C given B. And a multiplication of those is your probability of going from A to C in two steps. Likewise, you can define for n number of steps, but it will not depend on any prior state. So for example, here, it doesn't matter how you reached A. At P0, you, can you could have reached A from anywhere. It doesn't matter. And that's why this is a Markov chain. So uh, the only thing that matters is the transitions that you want to actually uh, monitor. Let's say now you want a, a generic probability of reaching to point B from anywhere in the network in two steps. So it could be like probability of going from A to B or B to B or C to B. There are three ways you can reach B. Now, if you are at A, then as we saw previously, what is the probability of going from A to B? Is one, you were at A in this first step which means your probability of being at A on step one is uh, relevant. And from in step two, you can go from A to A itself or you can go from A to B. So that's why degree of A is important. So basically probability of going from B to A in the second step is probability of being at A on step one, like in the previous step upon the ways number of paths on which you can go from A, which is degree of A. So far so clear? Or should I repeat? Please repeat. You want to repeat? Okay. Okay. Let's, let's, let's just forget about the equations. Let's look at the graph. Okay. So if I were to tell you what is the probability that in this particular step. So let, let's assume that I am moving from anywhere to anywhere on this graph, okay? Since infinite time, since minus infinity. 
and i want what is the probability that i will be at b at time stamp 2 what is the probability how will you compute that so you will say that okay how can i reach b at time stamp 2 depends on where i was at time stamp 1 so which is probability of being at a b or c in 1 p1 of a p1 of b or p1 of c so at step 1 if i were at any of these three nodes only then i can be at b in step 2 right because b is connected only to these nodes nowhere else now if i were at a in step 1 i can either go back to a like i can keep traveling there or i can go from a to b that means that even if i was at a with 30% probability only half of that time i will go to b in the next step the other half i'll remain at a so that's what that's where the degree of a comes from and if you add this up this will give you exactly where i will like the probability with which i will be at point b sentence b or node b just abstract uh, at time stamp 2 so you see the recursion here because again to compute p1 of a you will have to depend on p0 of a b and c right so at any time if you want to compute yes, the probability with which u will be at a point u you will depend on the p and my p of n minus 1 at all its neighbors and divided by the degree of those neighbors right now you might be thinking like okay we are talking about text summarization but what all this nonsense is there like why do i care about markov chains and this traversals and all those things okay let me tell you so these probabilities these basically tell you how well connected a node is to other nodes so if a probability of reaching at point b is very high for me that means that i can reach to b from several different points which means it is well connected so this probability can be seen as a notion of importance of that particular node right uh okay hold on to this mm -hmm. and it will be more clear as we move on but uh, if you have any doubts just feel free to ask me did i manage to at least somewhat clear the notion of markov chains yes sir okay okay we can come back to this if it's not clear like let's see an example and then it will all be clear <coughs> okay let's let's ignore this for now because it will just confuse you further but let's just say that uh, this equation can be represented as matrix b b transpose so basically if i am like uh, importance of nodes at time stamp n is b transpose into importance of those nodes at time stamp n minus 1 right so uh, let's let's go back to our uh, previous example this example say we i am computing the importance of this particular dark green node let's call it 0 step 0 so step 0 depends on these five right so i'll add up these five with some some initial value i'll just assign some initial value to these five nodes i'll add up and compute this now i will update i'll fix this particular node and i'll update value of this node so in turn i'll use the updated value to recompute the value for this using the value score for this particular node this node and this node so it's it's an iterative process we fix all nodes at except one node we fix all other nodes at a time at a time stamp we update the value for that particular node and then we fix it and then update something else that's how this uh, time things works and this is what this equation represents basically your importance to so pn is set of like it's it's 
a collection of scores for all the nodes at time n and p n minus 1 is the scores of nodes at time n minus 1 so when you know the scores of all the nodes at a particular time you can then update all the nodes for and take a next time step this can be done by multiplying it with the b transpose matrix which is nothing but your normalized adjacency matrix uh, we will look at an example and then it will be more clear say this is your graph this is your normalized adjac adjacency matrix do you see how we normalized it so your a is connected to a and a is also connected to b so and it's not connected to c so the sum of this row was 2 we divided each entry by 2 so 1 by 2 1 by 2 and 0 likewise b has three connections of one weight one each so 1 by 3 1 by 3 and 1 by 3 and likewise for c so this is your normalized adjacency matrix let's say at time n your value your score for a b and c were p n of a p n of b and p n of c how could you compute that so say you knew p n minus 1 of a you knew then what you'll do is your p2 of c or p n of c let's say this is n so p n of c is basically it's updated using b and c but not using a so you multiply 0 with p n minus 1 a you don't care about what the status of a was in the previous time stamp so you multiply by 0 you multiply by 1 by 3 for the last time stamp of b and 1 by 3 for last 1 by 2 for last time stamp of c right so you can see this is b matrix if you transpose it your row like last row will be 0 1 by 3 and 1 by 2 i'm talking about b transpose not b so 0 1 by 3 and 1 by 2 when you multiply that with this you get the new p n of c so which is 0 into p n minus 1 of a 1 by 3 into p n minus 1 of b and 1 by 2 into p n minus 1 of c so uh, do you do you see the point now like why how we can represent this as b transpose into previous states is this calculation clear or at least somewhat clear yes yes okay okay so let's move on then so wh what does this mean say this means that if you have values of p n at any point you can multiply it by b transpose matrix b transpose is fixed it's it's not, it doesn't change through time it is fixed so you multiply b transpose with p n and you can get p n plus 1 now what if you want to get p n plus 2 p n plus 2 is again p b transpose into p n plus 1 which is b transpose like multiplying with b transpose twice right so basically you can multiply it with n times and you can compute your scores after n steps so that makes your life easier right say uh, you had 100 sentences or say you just had five sentences so you had a 5 cross 5 matrix which you want to fill with each each entry denoting how important or how connected it is the node is to other nodes so you fill it up you say that initially at step 1 all my nodes are equally important so p0 will basically p0 of a b and c will be all same 1 by 3 now you keep on multiplying with this b transpose matrix like you uh, and then you will end up with the actual weights that's what this power method or this eigen centrality tries to say and uh, there are certain conditions like uh, the matrix should be a periodic and irreducible uh, but since our graphs are non directional so you can go from any node to any node both the 
conditions actually mean the same thing <coughs> let's okay let's let's uh, let's look at a graph like this so what we want to do like is is the big picture clear what we want is we want to start with some scoring for each node and we want to iteratively keep computing the scoring until it converges and once it converges we get the actual scores for each node that is the objective here right and uh, this will not happen if there are such uh, partitions of graph say node d wasn't connected to a b or c at all which means that if you are in d you will never reach a b or c you will just go on circulating at d and d and d which makes it uh, reducible <coughs> so your your uh, process will never converge basically d will go move on like keep on changing independently of a b and c and your uh, scores will never converge for that to happen what we need to do is we need to ensure that even if you are in d there is some slight possibility that you can jump to a b or c at any point even if they are not connected so basically some kind of damping factor or lambda which is a small uniform probability of transitioning from any state to any other state and if we do this then this new adjacency matrix will definitely be a periodic and irreducible so what we do is this part you recognize this is our original equation and we give a weight d with a weight d we can say okay with some probability of 1 by n i can go from any node to any node and with 1 minus d we follow what we are doing before like it depends on the connections and your final equation becomes this so uh, how do you do this you start with a p0 you compute pn by multiplying this particular matrix with pn minus 1 with so if n is 0 sorry n is 1 then p1 is this matrix transpose into p0 now you see how much p0 p1 change from p0 if that was that change was substantial then you do this again so you compute p2 by multiplying this matrix with p1 and you keep on doing that until you see that okay now at p10 it is nearly similar to what p9 was there wasn't much change which means we are close to convergence and then we can end this and the p10 in that case will give us the final ranking of the nodes so this is this is the whole process summarized you create an adjacency matrix with pairwise similarity you start with p0 p0 is basically importance of each node that we define random not randomly uniformly so if you had 10 sentences initially each sentence will have an importance of 1 by 10 then you found out the adjacency matrix b is something that you computed already so you update p by multiplying b transpose with p0 iteratively until convergence upon convergence pn basically initially we started with each node to be of same importance 1 by 10 each you will end with different values for each node and then you can sort based on it and you can say which node was more important or which was less important okay fair enough i i know this is a lot to take in so just feel free to ask if i, I know some parts won't be clear but just ask a question and i try my best to clarify it anyone i hope you guys are not i didn't scare you too much okay do you want me to go through this again anyone no sir it's okay you can approach it further 
Okay, so uh, we we have this in our uh, hands-on session as well. Uh, hopefully, things will be more clear when you actually play around with the code. Okay, let's let's move on then. Let's see some limitations. So what we did until now was only saw some uh, methods of sentence extraction. Uh, what are the limitations of this approach? Say this is a slide about the TV show Friends, and I ran my sentence extractor. I said I want top fifteen words, and it ended up with these two sentences. Okay, maybe not fifteen, maybe twenty five words. So I got two sentences. Friends is an American TV television sitcom created by David Crane and Marta Kaufman, which aired on NBC from blah 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 to blah blah blah. Lasting ten seasons, the series was nominated for sixty-two primetime Emmy awards, winning the Outstanding Comedy Series award in two thousand two for its eighth season. So, do you see a problem with this? To a lot of uh, people, some of the details here might not be that important. Like, I don't care uh, who created it or. Uh, which channel aired it doesn't matter i am more interested in friends the tv program but because we select whole sentences and we place a threshold on the maximum number of words that we can select so we end up with just two sentences one of them the first one is pretty long and half of the things there are not important but it was still selected because the rest of was important but can we do better than this so can we do better than sentence extraction any ideas like what we could do here like this is a simple question right it, it, not, no maths nothing like Just so we it. can break the longer sentences into smaller and uh, precise ones and then uh, work on upon them process them right so uh, let's look at an example it, so what you mentioned is a sentence compression So let's say I selected it this way. Friends is an American television sitcom. Period. The show revolves around six friends in their twenties and thirties who live in Manhattan, New York City. Period. The series was nominated. The that sentence remains the same. So this is much more useful because we could just select parts of sentences which were important to us and throw away non-important stuff. So this is the next step from sentence extraction. So now we are actually extracting information from within a sentence. We are retaining only the things that are important to us, not the whole sentences. Can we do something more back, like something even better? Anything that can be done beyond this point? How about extract, abstract? So I could write a summary myself. or i could generate a new summary which doesn't really use phrases from the original text but it just retains the essence friends is a hit sitcom that follows the merry misadventures of 620 something pals as they navigate their lives in manhattan now you see this is written very differently and it maybe some people are not it doesn't interest them they, they just are after the information But at least some people are after how it is presented. So instead of blandly saying that show revolves around six friends, you can you say that the show follows the merry misadventures of some friends as they navigate their lives. So you see, the presentation sometimes is important. It 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 makes things more interesting, especially when you want to market it to customers. People will go for this summary rather than a bland summary. again did the next sentence it became one of the most popular shows of all time and has won several accolades including no less than 62 prime time emmy awards so you see this basically combines the information in the first two sentences of the second paragraph if we had to choose those phrases individually it would look so bland so it would say in fact we couldn't even do that so we cannot just say that becoming one of the most popular television shows of all time without rewriting that part wouldn't have made sense but because we rewrote it we could compress it and we could make it more presentable 
So this is the next step, next step in the summarization pipeline. Let's see how the whole pipeline looks like. We begin with a document. We do sentence extraction, which is what we already discussed, the degree centrality and eigen centrality, word frequency, all those methods. Then there, uh, say, let's assume that you were working with multiple documents, say 10 documents related to a news, particular news topic. It is very well possible that similar information was present in all 10 documents, like some information was uh, common. Now, because you just rank how good things are, you will end up with five sentences which are almost similar, but, but which all of which were identified to be important by your sentence extractor. Because it doesn't know that these two sentences are have the same content. But you don't want that. So what you do is you add a additionally additional redundancy removal module. You say that, okay, my sentence extractor ranked these five as the top sentences out of all 100 sentences. But out of them, these two red ones, uh, they are, have redundant information. I don't really need them in the summary. So let's drop them. And my final summary, extractive summary, will be these three yellow sentences. Right now, there can be more than one ways of sentence extraction. We discussed three or four today itself, and uh, it's difficult to say which is good, which is bad. There is there isn't always a clear winner. So sometimes what you can do is you can have multiple candidates for extractive summary. So candidate one, two, three, you then combine them to form an ensemble summary. So you take the best from this one the best from this one, the best from this one, and then find, this is, at this point, it is still just extractive, but an ensemble of different kinds of extractive summaries. Now, that part is really optional. This part in this uh, purple box is really optional. You can directly go from this yellow summary to sentence compression, and then abstract generation. This is what usual summarization pipeline looks like. Okay. So, so far we talked about sentence extraction. What about sentence compression and abstract generation? Like how can we do that? Until recently we used to use some knowledge of grammar saying, okay, um, if we go back to this particular example here, uh, some kind of post tagger and parser can tell us that a sentence that starts from becoming one of the most popular television sto shows of all time, this particular sentence is grammatically not correct. So we used to depend on such tools, such linguistic tools to tell us whether a sentence makes sense or not after removing some words. Uh, but most of that has been replaced in recent years by neural networks. So all you have to do in case of neural networks is show them that, okay, I have these 100,000 examples of how the original sentence looked like and how it looked like after compression. And then it will learn things on its own. Let's see an example. This is a real example from a real research paper. It's mentioned in the citation. So your original sentence was Russian defense minister Ivano called Sunday for the creation of a joint front for combating global terrorism. And your neural network converted it to Russia calls for joint front against terrorism without knowing anything about grammar or anything about what was important. Everything that was done was done by the neural network. You just gave them training examples, lots of it, and it figures out. So uh, let's let's talk about this in a bit detail. You remember we started when we started the first slide was basic building blocks of summarization system. One of them was uh, sentence representation, and we used cosine, we used TFIDF and word to wake. So there are more things that can be done there. One of which is sequential representation. So. Say you have a word to vector for each of the words in a sentence. 
how do you combine it to form a sentence vector any guesses or anyone like this this has been discussed i think already so somebody can uh, maybe attempt to answer if you have a sentence if and have word to vec embeddings for each word in the sentence what are the possible ways of getting a sentence representation or a sentence embedding out of it i am sure this was discussed anyone like just take a wild guess if if you are given 10 word vectors how would you combine them to for, uh, form a sentence vector uh using the if pause tags are available then using the pause tags we can uh, identify the noun phrases and uh, verb phrases and according to the grammar rule of that particular language we can arrange the sentence no but this is uh, okay okay uh <clears throat> but you don't want to arrange the sentence so let's say Uh, let's let's step back a bit uh okay somebody answered average okay that is correct that is one way to uh compute uh, sentence vectors so you remember uh, when we were using tf idf vectors or bag of words what we did was uh, sum up all the vectors to perf- to get the document or sentence vector so let's say let's go back a bit It's, it's it's not included, but but yes, the, the, basically you can sum up all the vectors to arrive at a sentence vector. Now, do you see any problem with that? Maybe the person who answered Aditi, do you want to attempt that? Do you see a problem with just averaging out all the uh, words? okay what kind of info so yes you are right we'll lose some information but what will be that information that we'll lose an important information uh, like uh, um uh, as we are averaging so somewhere uh, in the notes uh, if some information is at uh, and for example we are considering a six notes so mm-hmm. maybe some information is at the and at we are averaging it to all so at the particular fifth node is a loss of information okay so so for this particular example at least uh, uh, let's not consider the nodes like that that was a different kind of system here we just have six vectors there is no graph there is nothing we just have six vectors and we want to combine them to a single vector so uh, let me give you an example say you have two just two words good evening okay good has one vector evening has other vector and you say that we can combine good and evening by adding those two and we can get a vector for good evening but now try to get a vector for the opposite way so evening good is your phrase not good evening but your sentence vector will still be the same right so yeah, whether you add, is right so so for text especially if we want to move away from bag of words approach sequence is very important and these kind of averaging if things don't take into account sequences so what is the solution one solution is using something called recurrent neural networks let's look at this okay so how does a recurrent neural network work let's let's forget about all the mathematics all the graphics let's forget everything basically what we want is given a word t minus 1 so here t is a sequential stem within a sentence so do not confuse this with the time stamps in our gra- graph based approach that was different here wt basically means the tth word in a given sentence okay and what neural recurrent neural network does is it tries to 
form a partial representation of the sentence using the words which already it already knows so basically at timestamp t your output will be based on words 0 to t minus 1 Okay, so you start with word embedding of T. Okay, let's let's look at the next. This uh, so it's it's the same network but represented differently. Let's look at just the first block. You have W zero. Okay, W zero basically can give you embedding for W zero word. You can get uh, word to vector embedding, which is this this first layer. That's your word to vector embedding plain simple lookup. Now you multiply that with a matrix F. Matrix you can learn from it. Now, once you multiply this with a matrix F, you get some value here, some intermediate value in H zero, which you further multiply with matrix T to get representation of the sentence until W zero. Just just imagine as matrix multiplication, you give an input vector, multiply with two matrix, and you get the output vector. simple enough we'll come to how we get those vectors but let's assume we have those matrices t and f now the important thing is when you do this for w1 now or h1 will not only depend on f w1 but it will also depend on u into h0 so it will not just depend on the new word it will depend on what it has already seen now if you replay interchange these words so if you gave w1 first and then w0 then your h0 will change accordingly right so in the end when you get the sentence representation it will be different for different order of words so the way in which you give words will affect the end output that's that's the high level idea about how rnns work uh any questions like is this part clear yes sir okay what about other people like are you guys still with me do you want me to slow down okay all right so rnn is a way in which you can get a representation of sentence which depends on sequence of the words in input as simple as that now let's look at uh, something called sequence to sequence model so in the previous model here what you did was you gave input input sentence w0 w1 and w2 and you got a, a final representation of the whole sentence okay what do you do with that say i am interested in sentence compression so my rnn basically combine these words in the column into a single sentence vector sentence vector is basically a bunch of numbers now how do i use that sentence vector to generate these new words on my row that is the question so for that we can use something called a sequence to sequence model so basically at this point you you can see my cursor right at this point at the end of the first block the representation is exactly what you got from here so it basically encodes how are you question mark into one single vector at this point now you look at that vector and you say okay when i caught this kind of vectors previously i generated the word i that's it i generated the word i nothing more so let let me generate i because this is my input vector now if i is the word that i generated at step 1 i feed that back into my system and say okay this was my question i was the first word that i generated then what should be the next word it will generate m and good now let's see if you are trained this differently and or or let's say your question was different how am i then your your uh, 
decoder will look at these sentence encoding and it will generate the first word u instead of i. You can say, okay, u, and then the next one will be r. The next one will then be fine or good or anything. So basically, we'll look at what we have seen until this point in sequential order and we generate the next word. Now, this is a question answering example, but the same thing could have been trained to do this. Say, for example, I saw Russian. So I saw this, like I encoded this column into a single vector, which predicted my first word as Russia. And then I feed back Russia into the system and say, okay, this was my input. This is what I have generated so far. What should be my next word? So it will generate calls. And then again, for joint front against terrorism. As simple as that. And <coughs> let's, let's go back here. Okay. So let's assume that I fed in this sequence. I already generated the first word as Russia. Okay. Now the second word, how do I know like what second word, what exactly second word? I, I have a lot of options. Like I can generate maybe 10,000 words for that particular uh, position. But I look at, again, I look at this and I look at parts of this, not, not the whole sentence, but also the parts of it. And I say, okay, while generating this particular word, I should pay more attention on this part of the sentence. So my, my, my next word should probably depend on one of these words, which is why you see this had this region had a higher weight. So darker the weight means while generating calls, your system used information in this part of the sentence. So it no longer focuses on the whole sentence. It focuses on a particular part of the sentence. And while generating calls, it focused on this part of the sentence. Likewise, for generating front, it focused on joint front for. So these are the darker regions. This is where your system focused on while generating front. Because remember, it has all the information. It has this information already fed into via the encoder. So it can choose what to use when generating a particular word. Okay. That's basically your attention based sentence generation or compression or whatever you can call it. Let's take a pause uh, and let's get some questions. I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of doubt. This is not very easy to understand. So uh, uh, mm -hmm. I have a doubt uh, in the yeah. question answering sequence to sequence model. Mm -hmm. How did we know that it will generate I in the decoder? Like, is it based on some training data? Yes, it is based on training data. So basically what happens is, you see, at this point, you have information about what was the question. So you combined these embeddings into some sentence embedding in some way. And then your model basically looked at uh, the training data and said, okay, if this is what my sentence embedding looks like, these are the possible words that I can generate for the next uh, position. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Like, feel free to ask, like, because this is no. this can be confusing. Yes, Monali. Uh, so uh, we are seeing that on particular part, uh, it is like uh, having a uh, and uh, so can you go on that uh, one? example? Yeah. yeah uh, yes. Yes. So it will choose uh, from the range uh, uh, near to the call, and that's why it selected call. So it is uh, depend upon uh, the uh, parse tree. So from where we consider each Okay. Uh, so it, depending uh, upon the relationship between the uh, word phrases. Right. So that is a good question, Monali. Uh, for this particular paper, they did not use any parse tree, but they did know that okay if russia was generated so what what happens is the first word you get some kind of relation here right so if russia was generated from russian 
uh, and this is this is uh, something which is still a black box so i'm just explaining you from a high level it might not be exactly correct so but let's say it knew that russia is generated from russia right sure. now uh next word should be generated from something after that so maybe defense minister ivanov were called because there is some kind of sequential information involved that is one point that can go into the training the second thing is ivano uh, like Rush, defense minister ivano might not be that important because russia russia represents basically the whole phrase this again it can know from its training data so it has seen a lot of cases where a uh, country followed by some minister was compressed into just a country name so that's something that it has seen from the training data training data right okay okay so now it know, now that it knows that okay defense minister ivanov is probably not important so then the next thing is called right okay sir So, so it will get it from training data. Yes, it will get it from training data. So, so uh, okay. Let me just uh, elaborate how this particular paper, like in this particular paper, what they used for training was, they took three uh, hundred, I think three hundred thousand news articles, and they uh, took the title of that article, which is what you see on the row. So, Russia calls for joint front against terrorism is the title of that article. and then they took the first very first sentence of that article as the input text so the assumption and which is usually true in case of newspapers is the first sentence talks broadly about the topic of the uh, article and it mm-hmm. usually has a lot in common with the title so that's how they trained they, they said okay this was this was my first sentence of article and this is what i got as my title it gave we we gave them like 300000 examples and it learned that okay if this is what the input sentence looks like this is what the output sentence should look like so that part is actually common across all neural networks what the new thing in sequence to sequence model is basically you can retain the sequential information within your input as well as the sequential important information like generating one word at a time that is something that was missing before so learning the neural networks always learn from data but the new part here to understand is the architecture so uh, we basically feed in one word at a time digest the whole article into a uh, sentence vector or into a sentence vector or document vector and then you generate one word at a time taking in feedback like what it has already been generated right yes, so uh, did i manage to answer your question monali yes sir thank okay. you sir any other questions okay so then let's move on so uh, do you see a problem here anyone so let's say uh, this is what my whole uh, so this is just a deep, different representation of the same system right there is an encoder and there is a decoder so here is your encoder here is your partially generated summary this decoder and your next word the only additional thing here is attention module so you no don't just look at the final sentence encoding you also look at the intermediate representations of the word and use that to say okay while generating this new word s3 i should probably pay attention on w3 and w4 this is where your this this module defines like where you will pay that attention okay but uh, do you see any problem here any one of you say uh, i trained my news article like my uh, my model on 100000 news articles and i got a new news article about uh, covid which was a new topic it has never been discussed before in news what happens then what will be the problem in that case so the problem will be 
you might not have the embeddings for those words so say covid is not present in your word to word vocabulary what will you do with that how will your encoder function in that case and without knowing what the input was how will you generate the output so somebody came up with a very um, interesting uh, idea which is basically we don't always need to generate new words so say let's say we already know 100000 words and our input article contains something which is not in our vocabulary <coughs> okay so uh, what do we do then then we say okay we still want covid to be part of my summary or part of my compressed sentence or part of my generated sequence but how do we do that so we say that okay i didn't encounter this uh, particular word in my input vocabulary but it is there in the news article so it might be important it's a new word and it would be important and in that case why don't i simply copy it over to the summary so you say if there was a sentence that talks about covid then instead of trying to generate a uh, some compressed version i simply copy over the whole sentence so basically now this becomes semi abstractive so in case i don't know how to generate i can copy over things from my input text okay so uh, let's say let's say my uh, this was my vocabulary okay let's say a to zoo was my vocabulary and argentina wasn't a part of it let's assume that argent i never encountered the word argentina before and i got the input germany emerges victorious in 2-0 win against argentina on saturday now i have never encountered argentina but i have encountered sentences like germany emerges victorious against italy or cuba emerges victorious against uh, i don't know maybe brazil something like that so i know sort of what to expect say if i have generated summary so far germany beats i know so far that i want to expect something like something which appears in this kind of context now argentina appeared in that kind of context and i cannot process argentina because it wasn't a word vector but i knew that because of the context i know that okay argentina should likely go there so what i do is even if it's not in part of the my known vocabulary i copy argentina over to the summary so i give it some like some probability that we can either choose from the words that we already know or when we encounter a new word we can add that word directly to the summary so we don't always generate we sometimes copy things over when we don't know what we are dealing with but rest of the things that that uh, remain same so if you forget about this 1 minus p gen module the rest of the things is exactly your sequence of sequence uh, architecture right okay again uh, time for another pause uh, ask ask the questions i i know this is not clear So, so it's like same what we are doing with what to like uh, as okay. the thought was that new word comes so it is going to be added. All right. So so let's say let's say uh, Russia. So the, the, uh, let, let's forget about the Russian example as well. Let's just look at this basic module. Okay. We get some words W one to W eight. Okay. We generate a final sentence embedding out of it. Now. using this we generate partial summary so we generate the first word then we again look at these eight words and say okay this s2 should be my second word but how do we come up with this s1 s2 s3 so until now the assumption was we know 100000 words and we were actually picking one out of those 100000 words okay so we knew that okay my next word can only come from these 100000 words nothing else that was what we were doing with attention module but now uh, this new architecture 
that gives us a possibility that okay argentina was not some some a word which we knew already so uh, our original method would, would never have been able to generate germany beats argentina maybe it generates germany beat uh, brazil because brazil was the next possible uh, best candidate because uh, your training data has seen brazil a lot of time in this context so it would have generated brazil but uh, now we have a mechanism that okay argentina appears in this context so strongly that uh, even if we did it wasn't in our vocabulary this is very likely the word that should go next that's what we are able to tell now so we give a possibility that okay uh, you can either generate the wo- next word from the words that we already know or you can copy over one of the words from the input sentences to the output and the system should def- uh, decide this itself that's that's the whole idea behind these uh, pointer generator networks i don't know if i managed to uh, clear your doubt uh, but i can try again if okay so uh, i know this can be a lot to take in and we are almost cl- uh, at the end of uh, how we generate summaries like how summarization modules look like so uh, if you have any questions about the techniques extractive abstractive anything neural networks uh, feel free to ask or uh, we can uh, take a 5 minutes break so any questions anyone sir in this architecture uh, could you explain the role of p gen like how it is connected okay so let's say we you you got the idea about how context vector was generated right yes yes so uh, context vector was generated based on your attention so your your system at least knows that if these were my uh, words my next word should come from this region against argentina it knows that from context okay right so that's why we put a very high weight on this part of the sentence input sentence but it would never be able to generate argentina because here what it actually does is it selects a word from one of the words that is no, known already argentina wasn't known argentina was the first time like it was the first time that our system encountered argentina okay so uh, if we just left it to the decoder it would choose one of its favorite words like brazil or chile or something and would never generate argentina but what pgen does is pgen makes sure that this the emphasis on this particular part of the sentence is so strong that i should probably not generate but copy so pgen will be so low in this case and 1 minus pgen will be very high which means that i should rather copy something instead of generating so i should not generate the next word but i should copy this word directly from the input to the output and pgen basically controls that so a low pgen means this part will be nearly zero which means that importance to one of the known words will be nearly zero and 1 minus pgen on the other end will be very high which means that possibility of selecting one of these words would be very high uh, now he- uh, what exactly is pgen here like is it the prob- like what probability does it denote a uh, pgen denotes probability of generating the next word so so basically okay. you can get the next word in two ways either you generate it or you copy it from the input by generating means you select it from your known list of words okay okay got it and if if that is too low that means that you don't want to go to your known list of words you want to restrict yourself to the words in your input document so you you are not generating anything new so think of it as uh, uh the friends example right which added the new terms um, mary what was it he, he is right so some words yeah, he added some yeah. new words right 
so that yeah. is basically uh, generating words so okay okay i i think i'm confusing you uh generating words in that sense was so in that case your system still knew that mary was a wo- word known to your system so it it basically generated it from list of known words it wasn't in the document it was generated right yeah all right so that's what pgen indicates so if pgen is very high which means you can you need not restrict yourself to the words in your source text you can look at any of the words in your vocabulary you can generate new words as mm. opposed to that a low pgen means you cannot generate new words just try to pick one of the one words from your source text and how does like pgen get updated like how does it know that for the next predicted word pgen has to be low or whether it has to be high okay very good point so uh, we again it's difficult to know uh, exactly like because most of these weights are black box but it's it's a trainable weight so just like you train your context vector or you train your encoder you also train this pgen so you learn okay. like uh, depending on how your context so here you look at the purple uh, columns right purple bars yeah, yeah. so so pgen will basically look at these and decide that okay this is what my purple bars look like then my pgen should be low or high so it basically learns from data again it, it all answers lead to that point but uh, it learns depending on these attention weights oh, is it like so, some hyper parameter which is it, it is uh, yes it is a hyper parameter but it's a learnable hyper parameter so you don't usually set it manually okay you let the system decide okay yeah thank you okay uh, all right that was a good question uh, anyone else we still have a couple of minutes all right uh, okay so then let's take an actual break of 2 minutes i'll be back i'll get some tea
All right, shall we start again? Okay, so uh, so far uh, what we talked about is uh, what are the building blocks of a summarization system. And we talked about uh, some extractive techniques. We had a very bird's eye view of uh, neural sentence compression and neural uh, summarizer, abstractive summarizer. Uh, all this is okay, but I'm sure one question definitely comes to mind when we do all this is how good the summaries that we generate are and how do we know whether something that we generated is good or bad or really a piece of trash. So uh, evaluation is uh, something that we will discuss next. And before we go to that, I would like to know some of your opinion, like as a human, how would you evaluate, like how would you say whether a summary is good or not good? Anyone wants to try? It should be concise and should have the important words in the document. Okay, so so that particular part is known as uh, coverage. So basically, how much coverage is how um, how much of the important content you selected in your summary that is called defined as coverage. Okay, that is one point. The other point is compression ratio is basically how much you were able to compress the original document. That is other point. Okay, fair enough. Uh, this these points are good enough for uh, extractive technique. Um, what other things like imagine you are generating sentences then what other things could you use for evaluation the grammar should like the sentences should be grammatically correct right it should make sense you, it, you can't just throw in a bunch of words and say okay this is a summary it, it should make sense okay fair enough so uh, with that let's move on to evaluation of and uh, benchmarking like how we do it in academia and then I'll give you a brief overview of what the industry cares about, like, and how things are different when you work on the same problem in uh, university, like in research, or when you work on the same problem in industry, like how things are different. Let's talk about evaluation in academia first. So there are two kinds of evaluation. One is objective evaluation. Each evaluation, each summary is assigned a score based on some criterion. And usually you can automate this part. So uh, I'll come to a, a detail like how we do that. So based on content coverage, how much of important content you were able to cover. Let's say just in case of uh, sentence extraction, there are types of summary where sentence extraction is good enough. For example, uh, when we were working with court judgments and what we noticed is a lot of the sentences and head notes are very similar or directly picked sentences from the judgment. And in this case, even if we just extracted the good sentences, the summary would be acceptable. We needn't really generate or compress anything. So in this case, coverage could be defined as the number of sentences which I would expect would come in my summary versus the number of sentences which I were, was actually able to identify. That is my content coverage. Uh, in case of uh, abstractive summaries or in case where such direct uh, sentence extraction is not sufficient or in case your ground truth summary, human summary is not extractive, but you want to compare it with a system generated extractive summary. So in that case, your content coverage boils down to words or phrases. So for example, uh, I have a news article. I have written a manual summary of the article. I generated an extractive summary of the same article and I compare that with my manually written summary. So in that case, it will never happen or very unlikely that it will happen that um, there will be an exact sentence in my handwritten summary. So what I'll do instead is I'll look for word overlaps or n-gram overlaps, something like that, which is the standard practice for, for understanding how good the coverage is. 
So was I able to cover at least the important words and important phrases? That's one. Uh, second thing is subjective evaluation. So, so far, we don't have a method for automatically evaluating how good uh, grammar of a sentence is. So what we instead do is we generate sentences and we ask people to rate it on a scale of one to five, for example. So based on how readable it was, how grammatically correct it was, so readability is not always same as grammatically being grammatically correct. I'll show an example, but these are the aspects on which humans can evaluate. They can look at benchmark summary and then they say, okay, your system generated summary three out of five, four out of five, some, some scale. Okay. But usually you can do this only on a subset. So if you are generating uh, 10,000 summaries, you cannot expect humans to judge all of them. So what you do is you randomly sample part of it and then show them to people and say, at least these 50 summaries, you tell me how good or bad they were. And for the overall 10,000 summaries, you go back to your objective evaluation using content coverage, basically uh, computing overlap in terms of words or engrams or anything. And what are the types of errors there can be in summary? <clears throat> so let's see, I selected this sentence as my most important sentence, which was ranked one. After winning the toss, they decided to bat first and score 398 runs in the first innings. Grammatically perfect. It also has the content that we want, but it's not readable because who is this they? Had there been a team name, this would have been a perfect summary. But it wasn't because in extractive techniques, this is usually a problem. It's grammatically correct, good content coverage, but not readable. Winning the toss scored 398 runs in Pakistan first innings. It has all the right keywords, mind you. So if they were in right order, this would have been a perfect sentence. It has good content coverage, but grammatically it's nonsense and it's not readable at all. Rishabh Pant acted as 12th man and brought drinks during the break. Grammatically perfect, readable makes sense, but content wise, it's useless. I don't care what Rishabh Pant as a 12th man did, right? So these can be the types of error in both uh, extractive as well as abstractive techniques. And this is, these are the points on which a human can rank how good or bad a summary was. Again, like how do we do this? How do we evaluate this on large scale in academia? We create test collections. So just like training and testing data, we create such data sets. There are several data sets available. So for example, DUC or document understanding conference was perhaps the first uh, place where uh, systematic data sets were built for text summarization. So they have these 50 clusters of news articles. Each cluster has 10 documents. So there are 500 documents and each cluster is basically related to a particular news topic. 10 articles on a particular news topic. And then they got humans to write four different summaries, like four different humans to write one summary each for each of the clusters. So you have 200 handwritten summaries. And now you can use this, these summaries to compare against what your system generated using the uh, criteria that we discussed before. Then there are new data sets like CNN and Daily Mail. So now uh, with neural networks, the problem is you need large amount of data, like in millions or at least hundreds of thousands of data points. No human will be willing to write those many summaries. So what you have to do is you have to look elsewhere on existing data sets and see like what you can use as summaries. Things which humans already created for different reason. You can reuse those uh, for uh, using as training data. So for example, one data set is 3 million news articles from CNN and Daily Mail newspapers. 
so uh, each of these news articles has a three bullet point summary hand written by the news reporter itself this is how it appears on the website so you treat that as hand written summary and the rest of the article is content and then you generate your own summary from the rest of the articles and compare them to the headlines and see how good your summary was likewise in one of our experiments we collected 25000 scientific articles like research papers from nlp domain specifically and we treated its abstract as summaries and rest of the things as documents likewise we have 10000 supreme court judgments with handwritten head notes which we can use to train neural networks to generate new summaries and we can use these as benchmarks to compare our summaries against this is how academia usually deals with it right and there are set evaluation methods like root score is basically nothing but uh, n gram overlaps so for example you have a summary of 100 words how many of those 100 words also appear in your handwritten summary that is the nicest way root score can work now it doesn't take into account anything else just a uh, number of words in common okay so there can be a lot of problems i'll show you one problem uh, but root score is usually good i mean it's not really sufficient but it's workable for uh, extractive techniques because there all you need to do is identify coverage because your sentences will be grammatically correct you are picking up whole sentences so there is no chance that they will be grammatically incorrect so if you choose good enough sentences your summary is good enough and that's where root score can help uh, pyramid evaluation was another evaluation technique that was uh, developed specifically to take into account differences in human summaries so uh, you remember duck dataset has four summaries for each cluster four hundred and summaries and those summaries might not be the same in fact they are not the same most of the times they agree on some points they disagree on some points so when, uh, sorry for the background noise so when you use such multiple summaries for evaluation say your extractive summary has three sentences one sentence is in benchmark summary 1 one sentence is in benchmark summary 2 one sentence is in both the benchmark summaries okay so uh, which one is more important the one which is in both the summaries right because that's where both humans agree so uh, pyramid evaluation deals with this kind of um, idea it breaks down summaries into phrases phrases which like smallest phrase which still makes sense so it's not individual words but it it are phrases it it calls it semantic content units and then it rates those content units based on how many summaries it is in how many human summaries it is in if a scu is in four different human summaries it is very important and if your system summary misses that scu it should be penalized heavily likewise uh, if a scu is only in one out of the four summaries human summaries and if your system summary misses that scu or semantic content unit is probably okay because three other humans also didn't think that it's worth including so pyramid evaluation takes into account those kinds of differences but it's really difficult to work with pyramid evaluation because where will you get four or n different summaries for the same set of documents it's difficult to even get one summary so pyramid evaluation is usually uh, helpful only on smaller data sets like duc or tac but it wouldn't work with uh, data sets like cnn or daily mail where you have only one handwritten summary and likert scale is again like humans ranking summaries on a uh, scale of 1 to 5 that's what is like our scale is this is how we do things in academia when we do academic research these are the criteria that we use but is this enough 
it's easy to fool rocks for so this is a perfectly valid sentence is perfectly valid this a sentence both have same words the second sentence doesn't make any sense they will give you exact same rock one scores so rock score is useless when it comes to generative or abstractive summaries because it doesn't take into account grammar and this is not the only path where academia and industry disagree so now what i'm trying to do is so uh, i have been with academia for 6 or 7 or maybe more years i don't even remember i used to do the things this way right this is what i used for 6 or 7 years and then when i started working with industry i realized that industry doesn't really care about these numbers like it doesn't care about rock scores or it doesn't care about pyramid evaluation so what does it care about even in both cases like academia and industry you create data sets you define network architectures you define your summarization systems you do model training but at this point the paths diverge for academia you would usually do evaluation and benchmarking you see whether better results if yes then you publish if no then go back redefine your architecture in industry it's different you do beta testing are the users happy if no if yes then deploy to production if no then you redefine the network architecture but better results and users being happy are not always the same let me show you an example oh, okay before that let's discuss this like what's priority for the industry so industry doesn't care too much whether you come up with novel methods if a 100 year old method solves the problem it is okay for industry for academia no that's strict no no in academia if you improve results on an average it's fine it's actually good in industry no you have to improve for all catastrophic failures are not allowed in industry I'll, i'll come to that what that means simpler methods are more accepted in industry not in academia so in academia you are always curious trying to find new ways to do the same thing in industry if some simpler method works it's good both academia and industry do care about interpretable methods so it would be nice if you know why something worked or why something didn't work and academia doesn't always worry about predictable results so the biggest point is the point of contention is catastrophic failures say i generate these four summaries three of them are very good the ones in green one is really bad in academia i would be very happy wow 75% success i am going to publish this in the top journal in industry i would say no because the fourth one was so bad 25% of my customers wouldn't be returning so i would be frustrated like this is this doesn't work even if this in fact i would rather go to a simpler method which doesn't make everyone very happy but it at least doesn't frustrate anyone so that's that's the difference between how things are different in academia and industry and okay i think we are out of time so i'll skip this part so i think i'll end uh, the talk here on evaluation and let's take a 5 minute break uh, for questions like any any questions like how about evaluation or about summarization in general i'm happy to answer them so if you could explain the rock score again okay so rock score is basically uh say i have this sentence this green sentence okay i generated a very good summary okay and see the last sentence oops generated bad really summary i now if you break down these sentences into words my first and last sentence will have few words in common like i generated a summary right those four words will be common right uh 
the others are different but they they still overlap in these four words so this this overlap is nothing but root one score uh, now there can be different root scores so the, uh, the other root scores can be defined as i take pairs of words like i generated generated a, a very very good good summary i take all those pairs and see how many pairs i had in common with the last summary right so now things will be different now i wouldn't have much in common between those two summaries so that is rook 2 likewise you can go to rook 3 where you take three words at a time rook 4 and so on so, so is, is yeah i have please go on so it's basically uh, overlap in words or in terms of engrams like how many words or engrams both the summaries have in common so uh, is this always computed between a pair of sentences no it's it's uh, it's uh, it just in this case because here we are assuming my one sentence is a whole summary it's usually computed between pairs of summaries so it can okay. be like 10 sentences in one summary five in other doesn't matter okay but what you usually take care is uh you usually try to keep summaries of same size because say my human summary is just 20 words and i generate a 100 word summary for uh, from my automated system then there is a good chance that 20 out of those 100 words will be in my human summary as well and i will have a false overlap so to avoid this we usually summary length as close as possible in ground truth as well as the generated summaries got it thank you okay any other questions like feel free to ask questions related to any extractive techniques or neural networks or evaluation anything so in multi line summaries uh, like the main thing is the continuity or the flow of thought should be there no sir yes uh, so how i mean here we had dealt only about single line how will that be guaranteed that is a very good question and that is not guaranteed so usually a human would be able to evaluate that but otherwise in a system generated summary it's usually not guaranteed and that is the biggest evaluation uh, challenge when you want to evaluate summary we still have not figured out how to evaluate all those aspects we cannot evaluate grammar automatically we cannot evaluate this continuity automatically uh, it's not yet possible uh, what you can still do is there are ways uh, there are there's something called text entailment which basically says that okay if i had these five sentences and if i look at them sequentially sentence 3 seems to be associated to sentence 2 and sentence 5 seems to be associated to sentence 4 so there are ways to do that so uh we could attempt that while summarizing itself that if i were to select sentence 3 i should ensure that sentence 2 is also there for context otherwise sentence 3 will be meaningless but it's not full proof because that system that text entailment system itself is not 100% accurate so you uh, you can propagate errors very easily because that failed then your summarizer will also have problems so Uh, that doesn't always work the only way to uh, evaluate that right now is humans read it actually okay sir so all that we have seen till now is it uh, specific to english language because we know its properties or is it independent of the language we are considering okay i am glad somebody asked that good question sweeney so uh, all the methods that we saw today they are all language independent there are other language dependent methods where you use postaggers or parsers or chunkers or other linguistic knowledge but for this particular case all the methods that we discussed today they are all language independent thank you sir okay any other questions okay so i think i took a lot more time than we planned for a half an hour we are half an hour over the time limit so i think we should go on with the our uh, hands on session then shuru uh part if you want to complete then you can complete the our slides completely uh, no i think no i think they, uh, they will benefit more from the hands on session like they can actually get some feel that okay what's happening and 
some of the concepts concepts will get more clear when they actually play around with the code so i think we can start with yeah, the hands on session now okay yeah then let's do it in that way okay so i'll yeah. stop sharing my screen then suru yes yes yeah okay so uh, hello everyone uh, so uh, yeah uh, we have sent you an email on your google classroom so if you can just uh, look into it uh, i will be opening from my end as well yeah so this is the python notebook that has been shared with you uh, so yeah so i hope others have opened it from on on their side so in this assignment uh, we already have given you the implementations of uh, three of the three summarizers uh one is the power method one is the frequency based summarizer and the uh, other is uh the centrality uh, degree of centrality summary okay so here are the functions so if you see the sixth cell uh if you use this one this is the frequency summary and this is the degree of centrality summary and the last one is the power method so the implementations are already given uh, what you have to do is you, uh, there are some questions that are given down over here and we show it to you okay yeah so you have to uh, read these questions and then just uh, tweak with the code to some extent and then get your answers okay so this is the assignment and <coughs> yeah so uh, just to chime in a bit suru uh sorry sorry for the interruption so uh, the the idea here is to give you a feel that okay uh how known mathematical techniques can directly be used for summarization so summarization is isn't something that is greek and latin it's very much doable and the only thing you have to do is model the problem correctly model the data correctly and then with simple code you can generate summary so what i would try to do here is you haven't used any uh, existing libraries instead you can see how easy it is to create everything from scratch and uh, some of the assignment questions i wouldn't call it an assignment it's more like uh, exploration so that will help you to understand uh, how different factors affect different uh, types of summarization systems and you can play around tweak it a bit and see how the final summaries change okay i i hope most of you participate because this will be uh, i think this is even more useful than the talk and this is where you will actually get to learn things and i'm still around so in case uh, you have questions just uh, shoot like if something doesn't work or if you don't understand part of the code just feel free to ask okay sure what do you do so i think you can start uh, doing the exploration and then yeah if you have any questions then you can ask over here so what what you can start with is just read a file Read a reader give one of the text files, and try to generate summaries using uh, the frequency method, the degree centrality, and the power method. Okay, just try to use the existing methods and try to generate summaries and see how it works. Yes, and also one more thing is that before you uh, start running the cells, uh, just see to it that you uh, use these three lines in the beginning itself. the ones that i have highlighted over here uh, otherwise you will get an error okay and one more uh, thing that i would like to say here is that um, if you go down yeah in the upload part uh, just see to it that you upload all the files over here 
Okay, so those are the only two things. Okay, sir. so when you use the frequency summarizer just uh, try to understand like how you can modify that for other purposes so fre frequency based summarizer basically assigns a uh, weight or an importance factor to each of the words and you can do it differently than just based on frequency you can you can predefine that okay these words are important or you can uh identify important words for a particular domain and say that these words are important there can be a uh, different ways of um, saying what words are important and not just frequency so frequency based summarizer can easily be modified to suit any purpose actually any of the summarizers but frequency based summarizer it's actually very easy i put my uh, email id in the chat so if anyone has any questions later on or wants to be in touch just feel free to write me an email
So, yes, so I'm getting a name error. Uh, in what part? Uh, when in the power method, I passed only the text and then it says name error or name tokenized sentences is not defined. So, uh, did you import like did you run the first very first cell? Yes, sir. Because that's what defines uh, a sentence tokenizer. Yes, sir. Okay. I ran that and the get tokenized sentence function also I ran, but I'm getting this error. So does get so get tokenized sentence works on its own? Does it work on its own? Uh, I didn't try that, sir. Maybe I'll... try that once. Yes, sir. So that is working, sir. That is working? Yes, sir. Um, okay, let me do something. Um, can you maybe uh, Shuru? Shuru, Udumi ki acho? Yes, yes, I am there. I was on um, mute. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, can uh, we? Uh, okay, 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 okay. I think I know the problem. Uh, just give me a second. Huh? If you want, you can join me in the collab itself. Like we are sharing the screen, so you can work through here. Yeah. No, I I think there is a there is a problem there. Okay. Uh, can you change the two uh, tokenized sentences to tokenized sense? So, can you go to get sim matrix method? So, one minute, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Tokenized sense to sentences in the parameter. Uh, no, 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 not in the parameter. No, not that method. Go to get sim matrix. Ah, yes, sir. In oh, sorry. I, I, I'm looking at a different screen. Sorry, that's why I got confused. Okay. Yeah, in the for loop, in, in within enumerate. Okay, sir. In both places, change the sentences to sense. So to match with the parameter. Oh, okay, sir. Okay.
थैंक यू सर इट वर्क राइट यस सर इट वर्क so you just pay attention to how these iterations work and what changes during each iteration and that should give you a good idea about uh, how the whole power method really works that should give you better intuition oh sandeep bhai already mentioned that in the comment thank you sandeep bhai he is not there anymore who is there so i hope all, everyone was able to do at least the first uh, point anyone who has already started with the second point i am trying on the second point sir okay let me know if you need any help and it should be yes. very uh, intuitive if you look at the code for uh, the summarizer it should be fairly intuitive like what you need to do yes if not then just look at uh, scores for individual sentence make print it somewhere and look at the scores and that should give you a hint yes
is anyone done with the second question Shuru, can you go to the get freak sum summary method? Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay, so now go to the assignment. Go to the question? Questions, yes. Okay, yeah. I think there is a typo in the question too. So basically, the current implementation favors a shorter sentence, and you want to modify it to make it favor longer sentences. So anybody is still working on the second question, just uh, keep in mind the typo. Right now, we are getting shorter sentences. We want to make them longer in the summary. Okay, I can give you a hint for the second question. Basically, if a sentence has more number of words, it will also have more number of frequent words. So if you look at the code, you have to modify it so that your score directly depends on the number of words in a sentence.
okay let's uh, uh, talk about six question a bit maybe uh, you can take some of these questions offline uh, but let's uh, six question is something which i want you to uh, attempt at least all of you sorry seven question in your case so uh, suppose you are interested in finding how covid spreads not nothing else about covid just how it spreads so how would you use this context and the freak sum like how would you modify the freak sum summarizer to just give you that information anybody wants to attempt to like forget the code just attempt to answer that um, like how you how would you handle that how would you hand, uh, change the freak sum summarizer or the frequency based summarizer to handle this additional context anyone wants to attempt that uh, sir we can yes. probably search for sentences uh, having words like for instance uh, contact with some other individual or symptoms like that right right that is correct but how would you modify the frequency based summarizer to achieve that like what what exactly needs to change in that case so you can so, have a pre defined Uh, sorry, just a second, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Shuru, can you scroll up to that particular method? Yes, one. So the power method, right? No, no, no. The frequency based. Oh, okay. One second. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm okay. there. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Swan, uh, go on, please. Uh, sir. So in the. Uh, uh... uh we are getting the score term frequency right for each and every word in the sentence right. so here instead of finding the term frequency for every word we can have a pre defined list of words which uh, categorize that you know covid spreads through these many means and for those words alone you can probably find the term frequency and calculate the score i'm not that sure that is that is perfect that is perfect so basically you look at the uh, line uh, where it says scores of sid and then you sum over tf of uh, tf dot get of w0 so, so in, instead of that you you add an additional content that instead of all words in s you use for w in your predefined list of words so so if if that word is both in s and in your list only then you add uh, that to your score and not otherwise so that's very good good swarna your answer is like that's that's exactly what you need to do Okay, are you guys stuck anywhere? Anybody, anybody who was able to solve the second question? 
feel free to ask if you are stuck anywhere okay Okay, how about the third question? Was anybody able to figure out why the word overlap method is wrong? Like, what is the error in there? So this is a simple one-line method, right? And the error is not very easy to spot. Anybody wants to attempt that? No, uh, Sandeep bhai, uh, sentences are passed. So list of words is passed in case of word overlap. So let me let me give you a suggestion. So uh, if anybody wants to attempt question three, just pick up your own favorite two sentences. Just or you can type in new sentences. Call the sentence tokenizer on that. and pass that output to word overlap and see what happens see where it goes goes wrong okay that should give you a hint I think if words repeat, that information would be lost because it's a set. Sir. Okay, sorry, sorry. I I was on mute and I kept talking. So let's assume that. Um, in a in a sentence important words are not repeated very often so taking a set is not a problem that should be okay 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 uh, it has more to do with how we compute the overlap i mean it's just a one line and that's where thing can go wrong right so i think shuru is showing something shuru yeah i just tried the intersection part so No, no. Just call word overlap, and then things will be more clear. Okay. I wrote the same. Uh, okay. No, there, there is length, same. right? Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, I should have.
ओके नाउ एड वन अनदर सेंटेंस एस थ्री और ओके यू आर यू आर ऑन द राइट ट्रैक आई थिंक Reputation is not taken. No, reputation is not. That is okay. I mean, that is valid. I mean, how many times will a word repeat? That is not the problem. Maybe change that last word to something else. Or add one more sentence. S three. S three with just hello world. i think uh, the capitalization is not being taken care of uh okay that uh, i think is because uh, shuru just called word tokenize but when we uh, call sentence tokenizer uh, the we are already lower, taken yeah, yeah. we are already okay. lower case mode. okay let me tell you let me ask a question when you are given s1 and s2 and s2 and s3 Which pair is more similar in your opinion? The first two and the last two. Which one are closer? Which one should be closer? Last two. Last two, sir. Right. And is that what's happening? Is that what's happening? No, the result for both is same, so it shouldn't be that way. Exactly. So now that is your hint. Now it should be straightforward. what do you need to do is it like uh, we should work on the phrases no 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 you should basically normalize it so mm -hmm. you keep on adding words and it doesn't matter so you should normalize it with lengths of s1 and s2 so if if there is s1 is longer than s3 then it should be less similar naturally shuru set ke andar length nahi jayega in the denominator number of words not length length will take number of characters in that case sir i didn't understand by the number of words in which sentence sir so in denominator you have to also account for so say you have three words in common out of five or three words in common out of 100 they are different cases right so in the numerator you just consider what what number of words you have in common in the denominator you have to also consider how long the input sentence is where so basically you have to take lengths of both the sentences in the denominator to normalize it no s1 and s2 so then your denominator should also be s1 s2 right yeah. right and now compare s2 and s1 that will be different less than it should be less than 0.4 
right now you see the difference now oh. actually s2 and s3 are more similar compared to s1 and s2 that's what we wanted because s1 has those additional words which we never accounted for while computing over there Uh, is this the reason why we've done a similar thing in get frequency method there also when we are computing the score for a sentence we are adding the term frequency of all the words and then we're dividing by the length of the sentence so that is actually your answer to question 2 so we can normalize or we cannot normalize so if we don't normalize then what will happen is we'll favor longer sentences because yes, yes. right so yeah. say you have five important words out of 100 and five important words out of five they will be treated same if we don't normalize it right or little different example say we have six important words out of 10 or five important words out of five so currently the latter one will be more important so five out of five is more important if we remove the denominator there then the first one will be more important so there we'll get you know, automatically get longer sentences because they will also have more frequent words and there is a trade off between these two you can use a log of the length then you will have you will have a trade off between long and short sentences somewhere in between so instead of dividing by length you divide by log of length okay okay anyone who is now like has understood how the power method works and wants to uh, try explaining it now it should be clear like the code is in front of you and it's very simple code so what exactly are we doing there did anyone attempt the fourth uh, question i am trying sir i am just letting you know once sir all right okay the delta values are reducing Delta values are reducing. Uh, yes, so what is this? So, so, did you increase the iterations or decrease them? Uh, no, sir. I just ran it. I mean, I didn't try changing it. I'll try it, sir. Okay. So, delta values are supposed to decrease. That is how you attain convergence. Uh, 
but just try to gain some insight into how the whole thing is working like how are you ending up with a particular score okay let me try explaining that part shuru can you scroll up to the power method one second yeah okay let's let's go one by one okay so we we begin with a uh, text we find the sentences from the text and then we find a similarity matrix okay so the similarity matrix has two components one is lambda upon length of original sentences which is a constant value the other other is get sim matrix of tokenized sentences so that will basically give you a matrix of uh, with values non zero values if the similarity between those pairs of sentences were greater than a threshold no the one above that so is this part clear to everyone how sim mat was com uh, computed okay so now what we do is we we normalize sim mat sim mat norm is we basically uh, divide each divide each row by the sum of that row that's how we normalize it so now if you take sum of along uh, along the rows for sim mat norm you should get one for each of the rows you can print that and check okay all right so then uh, we take something called as original score so the, our end goal is to give a score to each sentence we begin with the same score for each sentence so original scores is basically nothing but one upon number of sentences and that score is given to each sentence in the document right shuru yes sir uh, uh, shuru can you do one thing can you uh, yeah. uh, comment out like uh, can you uh, print the original scores and new scores just uncomment yeah. those parts no no they are there in the yeah. you know? and yes no uh, not that the norm no okay only the and the new scores and the new scores new scores so now what we do is we start with these original scores and we compute these new scores by simply multiplying a particular matrix to our original scores okay na ye intersection wale hata de acha theek hai ye theek hai so now you see acha uske aage kuch print kara dena to pata chalega ki kya original hai aur kya naya hai ठीक है अब उसमें ऊपर स्क्रॉल कर वो वाले सेल में एकदम ऊपर तक इटरेशन जीरो ऊपर ऊपर ओ ये सब क्यों प्रिंट हुआ एक मिनट नहीं आई थिंक वो स्कोर सिम गेट सिम मेट्रिक्स में जाओ वहां पे प्रिंट हो रहा है शायद यहाँ तो नहीं हो रहा है ऊपर जाओ ऊपर जाओ ओवरलैप में जाओ वर्ड ओवरलैप में नहीं वर्ड में भी नहीं
یا پھر کنٹرول ایف ہی کر لے یہ ٹھیک ہے اچھا نیچے تھوڑا اسکرال کر نیچے کچھ چینج نہیں ہوا ایسا لگ رہا نیچے نیچے سیکنڈ آئٹریشن میں جا اچھا آئٹریشن زیرو اچھا اوپر جا اوپر جا پھر سے اوپر جا وہ زیرو پہ ہی بند ہو گیا نا ہاں وہ نمبر آئٹریشن بڑھا دی نہیں وہ تو ٹھیک ہے وہ ٹھیک ہے وہ ٹھیک ہے تو کہاں پرابلم ہوا چینج کیا کیا تو اوپر جا تھوڑا یہ پرنٹ کر سم میٹ نارم ڈاٹ سم پرنٹ کر ٹھیک ہے نا ابھی اس پہ اس پہ ٹاپ پہ چلا جاؤ سیل میں اوکے آل رائٹ سو ایوری ون لیٹس لیٹس ٹرائی ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ ہاؤ دا پاور میتھڈ ورکس سو یو سی دا اوریجنل اسکورس دیٹ وی پرنٹیڈ ایٹ دا ٹاپ دے آر آل سیم اٹس بیسیکلی ون اپ آن دا نمبر آف سینٹینسز ناؤ وی ہیڈ سم میٹرکس بی that matrix we defined above we'll see that we multiply that with these scores and get the new scores so the new scores changed a bit right so now some uh, sentences are more important some are less important and we we then compare how much change was there between the new scores and original scores which is called as delta so delta here is 0.0095 at iteration 0 we keep doing this we multiply the same matrix again with these new scores now so the original scores are same as the new scores of prime previous iteration see uh, suru can you highlight those two new scores of first iteration and original scores of second iteration yes sir we got right it. they are they yes. are basically the same so now yes. you keep doing this and your delta should keep in, uh, decreasing and once that delta is below a certain threshold you say that okay we have converged now there wouldn't be much change in our scores so now the final scores that we get is basically importance of each of the sentence that's all that power method does okay sir so what you need to understand now is what is so special about that matrix that you keep multiplying it with sentence uh, scores and you get keep getting new sentence new scores so shuru can you uh, scroll up to the power method yeah 
okay yeah. Yeah. right so uh, look at sim underscore mat Okay, the first part is the damping factor that we talked about lambda upon length of original sentences, which is a constant. We don't need to worry much about that. The second part is one minus lambda into a sentence similarity matrix. That matrix is nothing but pairwise similarity of sentences, and if it is below a threshold, you call it zero. If it is above a threshold, you call it one. So, say you have five. sentences then your get sim matrix will return a phi cross phi array and some of those entries will be one some will be zero the ones will be where those sentence pairs are say for example uh, array of uh, 1, 2 was zero that means sentence 1 and sentence 2 were not sufficiently similar their similarity was below the threshold uh, but say array of 1, 5 is 1 that means similarity of sentence 1 with sentence 5 was above the threshold that's basically what that matrix gives us you add a, a constant value to it so that none of the values are zero if if the values are zero we add this small lambda upon length of original sentence that small value to it so that the matrix does not have any non zero values and then you keep multiplying that matrix with your scores with your uniform scores that you started with and you keep getting the updated scores until the change is very less and at that point you say that okay my uh, iteration has converged and these are my final scores that's it that's all power method is about and this is one of the most uh, successful extractive technique uh, so far So any questions is is this somewhat clear now maybe you can go yes, through sir. the ppt again yes, and then yes. you can relate yes sir understood so now try changing the threshold value the lambda parameter all those things and see how it affects the output the number of iterations everything sure maybe set the lambda to 1 let's see what happens uh, sir i have a doubt yes uh, the threshold value should it uh, is there any particular range of values only you are supposed to be using like i know you we can up change it but is there any limit for that so usually you do it with experimentation but 0.2 to 0.3 usually works very good i did i manage to answer your question yes sir all right okay this is after setting the lambda to 1 so can you see what's happening now so all your entire the iterations matrix, becomes less now sir yes but also look at the scores the scores haven't changed at all yes so because lambda uh, big lambda basically means you rely less on pairwise sentence similarity and more on a constant factor and lambda equal to 1 basically means all sentences are equally similar to other sentences and in that case naturally the scoring will not change if it was uniform to begin with it will again be uniform uh, further also right yes sir got it in fact in fact here if you even if you begin with non uniform uh, scores it should still i think converge to uniform scores that's my intuition i am not sure if that's correct but basically there is no difference between uh, sentences anymore and likewise if your lambda is zero then you completely rely on 
the sentence pairwise sentence similarity but you cannot keep lambda zero because in some cases you will never converge uh, if your lambda is zero so you should have at least some small lambda value because you remember we talked about the two um, two requirements uh, for this to converge is the graph or the matrix should be uh, a periodic and irreducible uh, lambda non zero lambda make sure that these matrices are irreducible and a periodic and that's why you need at least some small value of lambda so what i'll do is i'll share the ppt with you uh, i can share it with shuru and you can forward it to you all so uh, you can relate what we discussed in the ppt with this code and that should uh, help you understand better and uh, there is also this name of the paper is mentioned in the ppt you can look up the actual paper and try to understand what's happening so anyone is still trying the assignment any of these six questions seven questions i am trying the fourth one sir the fourth uh, one okay threshold effect okay that's a good thing so did you do you have any observations maybe shuru can help us shuru maybe you change the threshold and we can see what's happening yeah this is central Maybe set it point point one. Or you also need to change uh, something else, right? Uh, not not in degree centrality in power method. I think the fourth question was on degree centrality. I'm not wrong. Okay, I I think it's applicable to both anyway. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. so what i suggest is you go go to that degree centrality code and uh, this sorted scores right you print the sorted scores as well not just return once the whole the whole array that should give you some hint yeah so this is point 0.1 right now set it something very high maybe 0.9 or something and let that say okay anyway i think no, i will print okay. both separately uh, yeah then it will be better so you don't need to change the parameter there every time you can just pass it from here yes can you run the previous one with uh, 0.1 again that is strange go scroll back up to the code this should be different
Can you print the SIM mat? that is strange go scroll up scroll up okay wait go to uh, this get sim matrix that should not be same they should be different okay oh you have to normalize that word overlap for this one because in this case word overlap will always be greater than 1 or use a higher threshold use a very high threshold maybe yeah okay this also works this is okay <clears throat> i hope uh, everyone is following what shuru is doing yes sir <laughs> so now you see the you get different uh, summaries so if you keep the threshold very high in degree centrality all the sentences will be ranked equally most of them will be zero and that's why it will just take the first two or three sentences in sequential order and this keeps on changing as you keep changing the threshold so sure maybe 3 7 is also too high mm right so here you barely see one so see again they are, they are very similar again but as you keep like maybe keep it very low maybe 0.3 and 0.1 something like that so now you start seeing the difference no it's still the same right No, you have reached the limit. अब थोड़ा बड़ा ना पड़ेगा जीरो वन से जीरो वन से थोड़ा बड़ा दे जीरो थ्री कर दे या जीरो फाइव समथिंग हाँ स्टिल द सेम हाँ वाह बाल लगाया हम्म so basically if you keep the threshold too high or too low you wouldn't get any real ranking most of the sentences will be ranked similarly that's the effect of changing threshold on getting like this degree centrality based summary what it says sir is there any yes. range of uh, is there any range of lambda as well that we need to maintain uh lambda for the power method yes Okay, so usually zero point one or zero point one five, that range is usually good, uh, but uh, you should be careful of it not being too high. If it is too low, then the only thing that will happen is you will take time to converge, but you will still converge as long as it is greater than zero, you will still converge. But if it is too high, then you will lose most of the information. So it should never be too high. Too low is still okay. You, it will just take time to get you the summary. Uh, if it is like very much greater than one, uh, no. If it is still... if it is greater than one, then it will have problem, right? Because then the other one minus lambda part will be negative. Negative, yeah. Yeah. So then that will be a okay. problem. but i i uh, suggest that you play around with the lambda value set it from maybe 0.1 0.01 to 0.1 and so on and see uh, two things number of iterations and how different the final output is 
so uh, the final output shouldn't be very different for very low lambda you will take more iterations but you will still reach the same output ना जो ये तूने कुछ चेंज किया था ना उसके वजह से वो स्टैटिक हाँ वो ओवरलैप था है ठीक हाँ हाँ but I think yeah that is okay that's something that they that can clear yeah all right so I think uh, we are close to seven so we have a few minutes if anybody wants to have any last couple of questions then uh, I can answer them Sir, all of these are mostly analysis questions. So, is it just okay if we like uh, explain it in the text block and leave it, or? Yeah, yeah. So it's okay. You you don't need to give any answers to them. What you should do is uh, run the codes with these changes, and uh, just mention what you observe. Like, just mention your observations. That should be sufficient. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so uh, I think Shuru, we can call it a day if anyone doesn't have any more questions. Yeah, I think uh, yes. So we have all, almost almost seven. Long day today. Yeah. Yeah, but it was a very good session. I think everyone took something. Well, I I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for for being here. All right, and uh, I'll share uh, the, the PPT and my email ID. Just forward them, forward to the participants, and anyone who has any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Yeah, I will just send it on the classroom today. All right, all right, all right. All right. So okay. thank you, everyone, and happy Uttarayan, and enjoy the rest of your day and tomorrow session. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank yeah. you, sir. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you, sir. Tomorrow we start at 3 p.m. and uh, at 3 p.m. you will have your exams first, and then we will move on to the project. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you.